Hello team, uh, this is part two of the music. I know it says three, but this is 19th century Russian music. So there's three parts. Talked about folk music. This one's 19th century, and then the last one's 20th century Russian music. Uh, this one's a little bit longer than the last one, so you might want to take some breaks, maybe pause. I mean, just follow along, just watch like for fun, and just see how much you absorb, and then maybe go over the cram kit um, to go over like the real nitty gritty details. So first, what's the 19th century about? We talked about this earlier about the Westernization under Peter the Great. This is the same thing we studied about in the art section. Uh, Peter the Great, first of all, Europe and Russia never intermingled until Peter the Great. He loved European uh, culture. So he's like, hey, let's make Russia more European. So how did he do that? He introduced European style scholarship, improving education like European way. He reorganized the military. He created a regular army and navy. There was access to the Baltic Sea, so there was even like a transportation route to Europe. And then he built St. Petersburg, which was a city that was actually looks like it has European style fashions and European style um, institutions and, and all this stuff, like uh, a European dance. St. Petersburg is like the European style version of a Russian city. What happened because of this Russianization? Education was better, the military was better. Um, it sort of reinforced his, uh, his rule, increased international trade, and then we got more fashionable European style fashions over in Russia. Oddly enough, also in this time, there's a rise of nationalism. So we talked about folk songs really being the, uh, the reason for nationalism, but in 18th century, it really, really took, took hold. So we got these folk songs, and we also have Slavic, um, Slavic meaning the na uh, this is like native lang one of the native languages of Russia. So these types of songs, like the native tongue and folk songs, really helped promote nationalism. Not to mention Napoleon when he invaded in 1812, or again, we talked about in, in our class, that if anybody invades you or anybody like threatens you, now all of a sudden you are more nationalistic. So you know the burning of Mos uh, when the burning of Moscow happened, or when uh, this was like the December revolt. So this was dissatisfied soldiers. They were dissatisfied against one of the leaders. His name was Nicholas the First, and this czar he was hanged and exiled. That also these two things helped bring about some nationalism. So there's a new doctrine in terms of um, the new government's policies, and this is called the official nationalism. Oh my gosh, sorry. Official nationalism. So what happened is, is that the government's like, hey, we're going to do this now um, at Russian schools. So we have to basically talk about these things and make sure all Russian students know this. Orthodoxy, which means like the religion, the main religion was orthodoxy. Autocracy, meaning uh, the czar was the absolute sovereign awesome person, guy, god, king. So they had to teach that. Nation, uh, nationality, uh, you know, basically love for um, national. So orthodoxy means the dominant orthodox church. Autocracy, the opposite of sovereignty of the czar. Nationality, a little bit vague. There was no precise official meaning. So even though they had to teach these three principles, they sort of don't know what they mean by national. Even looking back, we don't know what nationality means. Uh, Chadyev someone that uh, wrote this letter in 1829, he was the one that's sort of concerned about Russia's backwardness. So he was sort of concerned, like, why are we becoming more European? Like, we are Russia. So Russia did not follow European tradition, so why are we acting more European? Because it was sort of anti-government or anti-Russia, authorities didn't publish this letter. So this letter, because it was so widely controversial, actually created two different ideolo ideological groups, these Westernizers, and something called Slavophiles. Westernizers, they're the ones like, hey, uh, European style, European culture is very, it's quote unquote better. So we support it. Slavophiles are people like, oh, we're, we want to keep the things authentic to Russia. So like we should reverse Peter the Great's Westernizing reforms. And they wanted a new world order led by Russia, not Europe. Like we are Russia. Okay. We also talked about divides in, by class and union in this in this 19th century. So there's this huge class divide, meaning the upper and lower classes were so separated. Uh, the abolition of serfdom. And this Narodic movement, you may not have heard the, the Narodnik movement, Narodnik movement. But what happened was is that city intellectuals, they moved to the countryside and basically sparked this renewal into the lower class. So people that were, I don't want to say rich, but they were from the city started to move towards the outsides, the outskirts of the villages, the peasantry, and they also start to get a 
um, appreciation for the lower class. So this one was a stereotyping um, the East. The East was a little bit different than the West. So not only was there a class divide between rich and poor, there was also a division between West and East. So people thought that people of the East were exotic, more Oriental, uh, more barbarians, more like less civilized. So there was two types of divisions, not only this class divide. One of the sections we listened to was A Life for the Tsar, this, this glory chorus. Uh, in this, the orth remember these are the three sort of uh, parts of that new doctrine that we talked about. So remember we talked about the official nationalism in these three parts. So if we look at, look at the song in those three, three parts, the orthodoxy, um, this is a hymn march. So uh, the rhythm sort of like this, a Russian chant. They use church bells. So this song, uh, they, why they made you listen to this song for the Russian sections because it has all three of these. Autocracy, these, lyrify, these lyrics glorify the first Romanov czar, so um, it also promotes or gives love to the main leader of this place. And nationality, so the church bells also affect nationality. There's an onstage military band that talks about like this nationalism. So that's why they chose to, to play this song for you. Composer is Mikhail Glinka, which we'll talk about really quickly. It's in, from an opera. We've got orchestra, military band, church bell singers, etc. A life for the czar. Mikhail Glinka, we talked about very quickly. He's the father of Russian classical music, and his innovations sort of already existed. So, for example, like he had some folk influences songs, but you know, Fomin's coachman at the relay station, they also had a protagonist. So he wasn't like the first one to do that. Uh, they thought it was pretty cool or innovative with his. Uh, the Life for Czar, like it was the first classical music that was centered on like a, histor um, a historical event. But actually, Katarina Kavos uh, premiered an opera based on the same story, you know, a few years before. So it's like, you weren't the first one to do it. His ambition, his goal was to create a Russian national opera. So that's why he got more popular, even though these existed before. Since he wanted to create a Russian national opera, etc., etc., he became more popular than the other one. A Life of the Tsar, where that song came from, the, the a glory chorus that we talked about, it's based on a true story. And in the true story, uh, Poland invaded Russia. And what happened is, is that a peasant tricked, that when Poland came in, a peasant sort of lied to the, uh, to Poland, like Poland is going after the Tsar. And so this peasant sort of lied so the Tsar can live. And eventually the peasant found out that she was lying and then they killed her. And that was sort of like this, that story of a life for the Tsar. So it was acclaimed by Tsar Nicholas I. And the comp compositional techniques, remember we talked about it, it, has some folk elements. And then it has some musical contrast based sort of on nationality. So when they, in this opera, when there's a Polish characters, these are the dances, this is the meter. When we're Russian, we're going to use this type of protagonia and this type of meter. So it's one of the quote unquote, I know I keep doing this a lot, but it's one of the first operas, first composed uh, compositions where we did this type of dichotomy with two different songs for the two different types of characters. Ruslan and Ludmila, this is another one from Mikhail Glinka. This is based on a, pair, a poem by Pushkin. He experimented with different musical colors. So um, they used the color to sort of depict nationality. So the, the, co the colors were like, oh, this is this nationality. We saw that in the last one in the uh, Life of the Tsar. Featured Glinkin, Glinka's invention, the whole tone scale. So we played it for you guys in class one time. Uh, and actually the public didn't like it, but it was a part of this, uh, a part of this opera. Again, Ruslan and Ludmila, another Mikhail Glinka um, production. What else did he do? Again, folk-like themes. He was popular for the five-fourths meter. Innovative scales, he changed, um, changing background variations, again, color and orchestra works, all of these we talked about. Maybe the one that we haven't stressed out, can you relate, or not can you relate, but try to remember his meter, or what he was known for, is his five-fourths meter. The next one that they have you guys listen to is Mikhail Glinka's um, Kamarinskaya. Remember, this is a slow, um, this is like sort of like a wedding song, a wedding dance. What you need to know is like it's slow, fast, slow, fast. So first it's slow Russian wedding song. Then we start the violins, which is like the dance, back to slow, and then back to the fast with more of this innovative variations. This genre, they call it symphonic fantasy with a full orchestra. So first, slow, fast, slow, fast, 
the featured excerpt, like what you what they mean is like this is the whole thing. The part we listen to is just the fast section, this part to the end. Um, the next people we studied, remember these are brothers, Anton and Nikolai Rubinstein. They established sort of several institutions to increase the prestige of Russian musicians. So they wanted to make them more popular, more famous, more awesome. So they said like, hey, let's, let's make these institutions so that they could be more awesome. So as a result, Russia entered into the world of international art music. So because they say like, hey, we came from the Russian school or we came from the Russian conservatory, all of a sudden the rest of the world's like, oh, this person must be great. Two things that they were remarkable for, the Russian Music Society, so they organized these public concerts, and then everyone could sort of listen to the music. It wasn't just for the elite. It wasn't just people that can go to the opera. Then they opened conservatories. If you remember, conservatories is another fancy word for a music school. So they opened one in St. Petersburg in Moscow. There are five-year courses. And what made it really, I guess, legitimate is that they got professors and people to teach it that weren't necessarily all from Russia. So they got some, a lot of them from Germany, which, as you know, has a lot of great composers. Um, <coughs> there's this, uh, this one right here, Stasov and Balakirev. These two, and this is another historical point, um, they wanted to assemble a group of musicians. So they wanted to create their own band. They wanted to create their own One Direction. Okay, So they get these people together. Uh, Mosorsky, Rimsky, Korsakov, Borodin, Kui. So these are some big names in Russian music. And they call themselves the Mighty Handful. And they wanted to make a really distinct style of music. All of these people composed, except for Stasov. He was more of a music critic, so he didn't compose anything. So he was just a part of the Mighty Handful. Okay? They were the people that had an anti conservatory stance. So it's like, they're the type of people that are like, oh, we don't need to go to school to play music. So it's like, we were, they're anti conservatory. They're like, you don't need to go to school to know authentic Russian music. As a matter of fact, part of the reason why they didn't like schools is that they're making music more Western and not more authentically Russian. So that's why this group, my new One Direction group, the Mighty Handful, came together. The Balakirev school, um, Balakirev, remember, part of the Mighty Handful right here, um, served as sort of like the musical mentor of the group. Um, he approached teaching differently than conservatories. So it's, instead of like, he still taught, but sort of informally and not like class, like, hey, let's all sit down and take notes. Um, part of the things that he did what was great. He sort of assisted like his students, uh, never, but never took credit for it. So what was really cool is that he was basically helping them, helping them, helping them, but took no credit for it. He advocated not using Western stuff. So they avoided Western elements and used simple accompaniments. Um, some of these things that they liked from the Bilakov school, okay, so he used some of the Western composers and some of them they didn't like. So even though he wanted to avoid the Western, he did like some of them. So this yay or nay, they liked Beethoven and Schumann, strong rhythms. They liked Liszt and Berlioz. These are famous composers like, oh yeah, we like Western composers, but these ones we hate. We don't like Chopin and we don't like Mendelssohn. So these are type of the things that the Balakirov school sort of um, uh, sort of like liked and disliked. So they weren't totally against Western or European music. The Oriental, they also, so this one they said folk music that we took advantage, not that we took advantage, but took elements from. And they also took Oriental elements. So we're talking about the Eastern side, they took elements of that as well. This listening section um, is from Alexander Borodin. We listened to it, it was like the second symphony. <clears throat> if you forgot it, you can listen to it in Dropbox. Um, it was the Russian warrior, very like manly, awesome song. Um, Mussorgsky, so we talked about the next person in the mighty handful. Mussorgsky is the only significant handful composer. So he was the only composer that actually was popular or famous. Actually, but in real life, like during, in his present day time, people thought he was like um, crazy, half competent. They thought he was mental. So he, he's the type of person that Looking back, we're like, oh man, this guy was amazing. But during the time, everybody was like, oh, this guy's lame. This guy's a nutcase. This guy's not, he's, this guy's mental. But now that we look back on him, we like Masarovsky. But at the time, nobody liked him. He was inspired by this guy named Alexander Dargomitsky. Uh, he drafted an opera called The Stone Guest. And again, that was also um, uh, inspired by Push one of Pushkin's um, works. 
he actually tried to preserve Pushkin's um, actual work. So that's why we say this operatic realism. They sort of tried to make it um, true to the story. So sometimes you watch a movie and it's like, oh, this is nothing like the book. So the Harry Potter films are nothing like the book. This one, he actually made it almost exactly like the book, and that's what he was trying to do. So The Marriage was the opera that he, uh, Mussorgsky wrote, and it was based on a comedy by Nikolai Gogol. Okay? It was not in verse. He only finished the first act, and eventually they sort of shelved it, and they never used it. So when it says up here, failed marriage, um, the marriage, the marriage that he wrote never actually saw the light of day, and it was actually considered a failure. Boris Godunov, one of the other handful, uh, the mighty handful. Uh, Masorsky began a new project based on P Pushkin's tragic play, uh, Boris Godunov. So what we're talking about here is, um, sorry, Boris Godunov is not one of the, let me go back here. Boris Godunov is not one of the mighty handful. Huh, take that back. Boris Godunov was one of the czars at the time. So this opera was saying like, oh, like I don't know if this guy is the right czar, if this guy is great. Uh, this occurred during the Time of Troubles. So if you remember it in arts and language literature, we talked about the Time of Troubles. Um, though he did not set the text word for word. So remember the last one, the marriage, he tried to keep it like almost consistent to the story. He remained faithful to the poems and didn't really um, copy word for word anymore. The first one that he did was closer to the original. Um, there was no love story. There was Boris's death. It was psychological. And the second one that he made was had a Polish act. Um, they had Boris's children sing songs. It had a peasant revolt instead of Boris's death, and added political overtones. So this Boris Gudinov, this production by um, by Masorsky, um, he had two different two different uh, operas of the same story. So one of the listening connections we listened to, if you remember, was Boris's death scene in the first in the first one that Masorsky created. So it's an opera. Um, and I was talking about this guy. I don't know if you guys remember the song. It sounded like a basically like a barber, uh, like a big-bellied barber, like singing like, like happy, but it's actually his death. All right. I know there's a lot of slides. Sorry. So remember, if you ever need to take a break, you can take a break. Musical Orientalism. So we're talking about music that is inspired by the Eastern regions. So when you say when you hear Oriental, think of the East, the East side of Russia. So the typical aspects of Orientalism, so you're saying like, how can a music be more Eastern? The second interval was more augmented. So it had, this is basically influenced by the Turkish, uh, from by the Turks. And it was a cliche by the 20th century where like all the Oriental songs had an augmented second interval. Orientals also had this chromatic harmony. So they had half steps over a pedal note. They had solo woodwinds, uh, like double reed instruments. And they had compound meters, like 3 eighths, 6 eighths. Those are the types of things that make things oriental. Some examples are Ruslan and Ludmila by Glinka. We talked about that. In the Steps by Borodin and Prince Igor by Borodin. Those are ones that have like some real Eastern influence. So the one that I have us listen to is by Kors Rimsky Korsakov. Uh, this one's from she Scheherazade. Okay. We played this before. Oh, we played all of these before, but this is basically. Um, what that's about. If you want to know what the story is about in this uh, in this song, the story centers on Sinbad and his ship. The pedal notes and the slow moving harmony to sort of represent the sea. And as a naval officer, you know this guy Nikolai Rimsky Korsakov, since he used to be a naval officer, he always has like sea or ocean represented in his songs. And what the ocean, the Oriental music really emphasized, as opposed to the folk music or traditional, it made it seem like it was like a sense of wandering. Um, next one was, uh, next person to talk about is Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was a little bit different than The Mighty Handful. Uh, this is Peter, Peter Tchaikovsky. He was one of the first graduates of um, the St. Petersburg Conservatory, and he studied under Anton Rubinstein. So Rubinstein, remember, they're the ones that opened up all these schools. After graduating, Tchaikovsky sort of accepted being a professor at the Moscow Conservatory. So. Really, it's really cool that he was, he was one of the first that studied at a, a conservatory, and then he later taught as well. Um, unlike the handful, so he wasn't exactly like a handful, um, what he did, so this is why it says Balakira fanboy, because he was, sort of had the same ideas as they did. So he believed in changing background variations. His favorite keys were B minor and D flat, and he also used these abrupt key changes. So that's, that's uh, what Tchaikovsky was about. 
He was sort of different than the Mighty Handful because he worked in St. Petersburg. Again, he was against conservatories, even though he was um, from a conservatory. And the strict guidelines for nationalism he didn't really follow. So then again, this is Peter Tchaikovsky. Um, in some of his works, uh, Tchaikovsky, he used psychorealism. So he talked about using intense human emotion, um, using harmony. His first major success was Romeo and Juliet because of this love theme. And then also, it's sort of as a representative of the psychorealism. The Fourth Symphony also uses more of the psychorealism, like intense human emotion. Um, this fate theme is where um, you know the, the the universe is acting against the hero, so like you're tempting fate or you're doing fate. He did this in the Fourth Symphony, and then this folk theme. Um, he talked about um, in the field there stood a birch tree, so he also beckoned back to like the outskirts, the the, the folkiness, and then this one right here, this name. Uh, Nadezhda von Mick. Uh, it was a patron, someone that like, I don't know if you guys know what a patron is, but they're the people that pay for you to do your work. He was a patron that requested a programmatic, like an explanation, and that's what, that's what the name is here for. Like, he was one of the patrons for this song. Um, Tchaikovsky, he, he gained his greatest fame though, like being a composer of symphonies, not necessarily operas. So he composed, or symphonies for operas. So he composed 10 operas, three ballets. He liked opera as the most you know, democratic art form, meaning like it's accessible to all the people. Um, well, his most famous opera is called Eugene on Onegin, Onegin. And it was internationally famous, Eugene Onegin. His music imitates Russian parlor songs. So that's why uh, it was very popular. Here's the story. Um, Tatiana falls in love with Onegin, who spurns her. Tatiana's sister, Olga, is engaged to marry Onegin's friend, Lenski. Olga carelessly toys with Lenski's emotions. Lenski dies in a duel of honor. Years later, Tatiana marries into the elite. Onegin falls in love with the newly confident Tatiana, who now spurns him. So it's one of those, uh, it's one of those like, hey, I... Um, I love you, and the guy's like, oh, you're like not cool. Then she gets awesome, and then he's like, oh, I think I like you again. And she's like, oh, oh hell no. So that's Eugene Onegin. So listening selection, uh, one of Peter Tchaikovsky's songs that we listen to is the Sixth Symphony. Uh, we played it. We could play these all again. Um, again, this is by Tchaikovsky. Next person, Sergei Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff. He compromised the ideals of Tchaikovsky and the handful. So the handful, conservatory, or um, conservatory, these schools, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he compromised sort of like in between Tchaikovsky and the handful. He, he, he included the folk, the folk stuff from the handful, but he also used the psychorealism from Tchaikovsky. So this is Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff. And this composer, conductor, pianist, he had five piano concertos. So the next one that we listened to was uh, the second piano concerto. This was by Rachmaninoff. And this is sort of the example of another famous guy in the 19th century that was sort of in between Tchaikovsky and the handful. Uh, two more slides, real quick. Russian music abroad. So in the late 19th century, now all of a sudden Russia started to get more popular internationally, not just in Russia. Tchaikovsky was the, the breakthrough. He was like LeBron James, or, or sorry, he was like the Michael Jordan. Like now it's popular, not just in the United States, not just in Russia, but all across the world. Helped that he was a representation as a conductor. He also became a celebrity. Um, Carnegie, Carnegie Hall in New York actually invited him to compose. So that's how he got popular. And one of the, um, one of the famous German uh, composers actually conducted a performance of Eugene Onegin. So all of a sudden, what they're making in Russia, they're trying to re, uh, reproduce in other countries. And the last thing you need to know about 19th century Russian music, uh, this guy, Sergei Diaghilev, he introduced the Saisons Russes in Paris, um, focused on like the Mighty Handful. So the Handful, the Mighty Handful, their music didn't really get to the international stage as fast as Tchaikovsky, but the Handful was also, eventually got international fame um, in France. So he introduced this stuff from the Mighty Handful in Paris. So he also staged other Handful productions. Um, these people, Claude, um, Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, they integrated Russian parts into their works, which was pretty cool. So imagine people in France are now copying ideas from Russia in their music. 
So they use operatic realism, which we talked about, and they also use the oriental and exoticism that we talked about. So that's the last slide from this section, 19th century music. I know it was a lot. Uh, we're looking at 25 minutes, so hopefully you guys watch this maybe, or at least sort of get the idea of what's going on in, um, in Russia during this time. So hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you guys later.